Chapter Twenty Two of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter Twenty Two in which Captain Crow is sublimed into the regions on astrology. Three whole days had our adventurer prosecuted his inquiry about the amiable Aurelia, whom he sought in every place of public and of private entertainment or resort, without obtaining the least satisfactory intelligence. When he received one evening, from the hands of a porter, who instantly vanished, the following billet. If you would learn the particulars of Miss Darnell's fate, fail not to be in the fields by the Foundling Hospital, precisely at seven o'clock this evening, when you shall be met by a person who will give you the satisfaction you desire, together with his reason for addressing you in this mysterious manner. Had this intimation concerned any other subject, perhaps the knight would have deliberated with himself in what manner he should take a hint so darkly communicated. But his eagerness to retrieve the jewel he had lost divested him of all his caution. The time of assignation was already at hand, and neither the captain nor his nephew could be found to accompany him, had he been disposed to make use of their attendance. He therefore, after a moment's hesitation, repaired to the place appointed, in the utmost agitation and anxiety, lest the hour should be elapsed before his arrival. Crow was one of those defective spirits who cannot subsist for any length of time on their own bottoms. He wanted a familiar prop, upon which he could disburden his cares, his doubts, and his humours, an humble friend who would endure his caprices, and with whom he could communicate free of all reserve and restraint. Though he loved his nephew's person, and admired his parts, he considered him often as a little petulant jackanapes, who presumed upon his superior understanding. And as for Sir Lancelot, there was something in his character that overawed the seaman, and kept him at a disagreeable distance. He had, in this dilemma, cast his eyes upon Timothy Crabshaw, and admitted him to a considerable share of familiarity and fellowship. These companions had been employed in smoking a social pipe at an alehouse in the neighbourhood, when the knight made his excursion, and returning to the house about supper-time, found Mr. Clark in waiting. The young lawyer was alarmed when he heard the hour of ten, without seeing our adventurer, who had been used to be extremely regular in his economy, and the captain and he supped in profound silence. Finding, upon inquiry among the servants, that the knight went out abruptly, in consequence of having received a billet, Tom began to be visited with the apprehension of a duel, and sat the best part of the night by his uncle sweating with the expectation of seeing our hero brought home a breathless corpse. But no tidings of him arriving, he, about two in the morning, repaired to his own lodging, resolved to publish a description of Sir Lancelot in the newspapers, if he should not appear next day. Crow did not pass the time without uneasiness. He was extremely concerned at the thought of some mischief having befallen his friend and patron. And he was terrified with the apprehensions that, in case Sir Lancelot was murdered, his spirit might come and give him notice of his fate. Now he had an insuperable aversion to all correspondence with the dead, and taking it for granted that the spirit of his departed friend could not appear to him, except when he should be alone, and a bed in the dark, he determined to pass the remainder of the night without going to bed. For this purpose, his first care was to visit the garret, in which Timothy Crabshaw lay fast asleep 
snoring with his mouth wide open. Him the captain with difficulty roused, by dint of promising to regale him with a bowl of rum punch in the kitchen, where the fire, which had been extinguished, was soon rekindled. The ingredients were fetched from a public house in the neighbourhood, for the captain was too proud to use his interest in the knight's family, especially at these hours, when all the rest of the servants had retired to their repose. And he and Timothy drank together until daybreak, the conversation turning upon hobgoblins and God's revenge against murder. The cookmaid lay in a little apartment contiguous to the kitchen, and whether disturbed by these horrible tales of apparitions, or titillated by the savoury steams that issued from the punch bowl, she made a virtue of necessity, or appetite, and dressing herself in the dark, suddenly appeared before them to the no small perturbation of both. Timothy, in particular, was so startled that, in his endeavours to make a hasty retreat towards the chimney corner, he overturned the table. The liquor was spilt, but the bowl was saved by falling on a heap of ashes. Mrs. Cook, having reprimanded him for his foolish fear, declared she had got up betimes in order to scour her saucepans, and the captain proposed to have the bowl replenished if materials could be procured. This difficulty was overcome by Crabshaw, and they sat down with their new associate to discuss the second edition. The night's sudden disappearing being brought upon the carpet, their female companion gave it as her opinion that nothing would be so likely to bring this affair to light as going to a cunning man whom she had lately consulted about a silver spoon that was mislaid, and who told her all the things that she ever did and ever would happen to her through the whole course of her life. Her two companions pricked up their ears at this intelligence, and Crow asked if the spoon had been found. She answered in the affirmative, and said the cunning man described to a hare the person that should be her true lover and her wedded husband, that he was a seafaring man, that he was pretty well stricken in years, a little passionate or so, and that he went with his fingers clinched like, as it were. The captain began to sweat at this description, and mechanically thrust his hands into his pockets, while Crabshaw, pointing to him, told her he believed she had got the right sow by the ear. Crow grumbled that mayhap, for all that, he should not be brought up by such a grappling neither. Then he asked if this cunning man dealt with the devil, declaring, in that case, he would keep clear of him. For why? Because he must have sold himself to old Scratch. And being a servant of the devil, how could he be a good subject to his majesty? Mrs. Cook assured him the conjurer was a good Christian, and that he gained all his knowledge by conversing with the stars and planets. Thus satisfied, the two friends resolved to consult him as soon as it should be light, and being directed to the place of his habitation, set out for it by seven in the morning. They found the house forsaken, and had already reached the end of the lane in their return, when they were accosted by an old woman, who gave them to understand that if they had occasion for the advice of a fortune-teller, as she did suppose they had, from their stopping at the house where Dr. Grubble lived, she would conduct them to a person of much more eminence in that profession. At the same time she informed them that the said Grubble had been lately sent to Bridewell, a circumstance which, with all his art, he had not been able to foresee. The captain, without any scruple, put himself and his companion under convoy of this belle dame, who, through many windings and turnings, brought them to the door of a ruinous house, standing in a blind alley, which door, having opened with a key drawn from her pocket, she introduced them into a parlour, where they saw no other furniture than a naked bench and some frightful figures on the bare walls, drawn, or rather scrawled, with charcoal. Here she left them locked in, until she should give the doctor notice of their arrival. 
and they amused themselves with deciphering these characters and hieroglyphics the first figure that engaged their attention was that of a man hanging upon a gibbet which both considered as an unfavourable omen and each endeavoured to avert from his own person crabshaw observed that the figure so suspended was clothed in a sailor's jacket and trousers a truth which the captain could not deny but on the other hand he affirmed that the said figure exhibited the very nose and chin of timothy together with the hump on one shoulder a warm dispute ensued and being maintained with much acrimonious altercation might have dissolved the new cemented friendship of those two originals had it not been interrupted by the old sibyl who coming into the parlour intimated that the doctor waited for them above she likewise told them that he never admitted more than one at a time this hint occasioned a fresh contest the captain insisted upon crabshaw's making sail ahead in order to look out afore but timothy persisted in refusing this honour declaring he did not pretend to lead but he would follow as in duty bound the old gentlewoman abridged the ceremony by leading out crabshaw with one hand and locking up crow with the other the former was dragged upstairs like a bear to the stake not without reluctance and terror which did not at all abate at the sight of the conjurer with whom he was immediately shut up by his conductress after she had told him in a whisper that he must deposit a shilling in a little black coffin supported by a human skull and thigh bones crossed on a stool covered with black baize that stood in one corner of the apartment the squire having made this offer with fear and trembling ventured to survey the objects around him which were very well calculated to augment his confusion he saw divers skeletons hung by the head the stuffed skin of a young alligator a calf with two heads and several snakes suspended from the ceiling with the jaws of a shark and a starved weasel on another funeral table he beheld two spheres between which lay a book open exhibiting outlandish characters and mathematical diagrams on one side stood an ink standish with paper and behind this desk appeared the conjurer himself in sable vestments his head so overshadowed with hair that far from contemplating his features timothy could distinguish nothing but a long white beard which for aught he knew might have belonged to a four-legged goat as well as to a two-legged astrologer this apparition which the squire did not eye without manifest discomposure extended a white wand made certain evolutions over the head of timothy and having muttered an ejaculation commanded him in a hollow tone to come forward and declare his name crabshaw thus adjured advanced to the altar and whether from design or which is more probable from confusion answered samuel crow the conjurer taking up the pen and making a few scratches on the paper exclaimed in a terrific accent how miscreant attempt to impose upon the stars you look more like a crab than a crow and was born under the sign of cancer the squire almost annihilated by this exclamation fell upon his knees crying i pray you my lord conjurer's worship pardon my ignorance and don't go to bind me over to the red sea like i's a poor yorkshire tyke and would no more cheat the stars than i'd cheat me own father as the saying is i must be a good hand at trapping that catches the stars and napping but as your honour's worship observed my name is tim crabshaw of the east riding Broom and square to sir lancelot greaves baron knight an arrant knight who ran mad for a wench as your worship's conjuration well knoweth the person below is captain crow and we come by marjorie cook's recommendation 
to seek after my master, who is gone away, or made away, the Lord he knows how and where. Here he was interrupted by the conjurer, who exhorted him to sit down and compose himself till he should cast a figure. Then he scrawled the paper, and waving his wand, repeated abundance of gibberish concerning the number, the names, the houses, and revolutions of the planets, with their conjunctions, oppositions, signs, circles, cycles, trines, and trigons. When he perceived that this artifice had its proper effect in disturbing the brain of Crabshaw, he proceeded to tell him from the stars that his name was Crabshaw, or Crabscrawl, that he was born in the East Riding of Yorkshire, of poor yet honest parents, and had some skill in horses, that he served a gentleman whose name began with the letter G, which gentleman had run mad for love and left his family, but whether he would return alive or dead, the stars had not yet determined. Poor Timothy was thunderstruck to find the conjurer acquainted with all these circumstances, and begged to know if he might be so bold as to ask a question or two about his own fortune. The astrologer pointing to the little coffin, our squire understood the hint, and deposited another shilling. The sage had recourse to his book, erected another scheme, performed once more his airy evolutions with the wand, and having recited another mystical preamble, expounded the book of fate in these words. You shall neither die by war nor water, by hunger or by thirst, nor be brought to the grave by old age or distemper. But let me see. Ay, the stars will have it so. You shall be exalted, ha? Huh? Ay, that is, hanged for horse-stealing. Oh, good my lord conjurer, roared the squire. I'd as lief give forty shillings as be hanged. Peace, sirrah, cried the other. Would you contradict or reverse the immutable decrees of fate? Hanging is your destiny, and hanged you shall be. And comfort yourself with the reflection, that as you are not the first, so neither will you be the last to swing on Tyburn Tree. This comfortable assurance composed the mind of Timothy, and in a great measure reconciled him to the prediction. He now proceeded in a whining tone, to ask whether he should suffer for the first fact, whether it be for a horse or a mare, and of what colour, that he might know when his hour was come. The conjurer gravely answered, that he would steal a dappled gelding on a Wednesday, be cast at the Old Bailey on Thursday, and suffer on a Friday. And he strenuously recommended it to him to appear in the cart, with a nosegay in one hand, and the whole duty of man in the other. "'But if in case it should be in the winter,' said the squire, "'when a nosegay can't be had?' "'Why, then,' replied the conjurer, "'an orange will do as well.' These material points being adjusted to the entire satisfaction of Timothy, he declared he would bestow another shilling to know the fortune of an old companion, who truly did not deserve so much at his hands but he could not help loving him better than e'er a friend he had in the world. So saying, he dropped a third offering in the coffin, and desired to know the fate of his horse, Gilbert. The astrologer, having again consulted his art, pronounced that Gilbert would die of the staggers, and his carcass be given to the hounds, a sentence which made a much deeper impression upon Crabshaw's mind, than did the prediction of his own untimely and disgraceful fate. He shed a plenteous shower of tears, and his grief broke forth in some passionate expressions of tenderness. At length he told the astrologer he would go and send up the captain, who wanted to consult him about Marjorie Cook, because as how she had informed him that Dr. Grubble had described just such another man as the captain for her true love and he had no great stomach to the match, if so be as the stars were not bent upon their coming together. Accordingly, the squire being dismissed by the conjurer, 
descended to the parlour with a rueful length of face which being perceived by the captain he demanded what cheer ho with some signs of apprehension crabshaw making no return to this salute he asked if the conjurer had taken an observation and told him anything then the other replied he had told him more than he desired to know why and that be the case said the seaman i have no occasion to go aloft this trip brother this evasion would not serve his turn old tisiphone was at hand and led him up growling into the hall of audience which he did not examine without trepidation having been directed to the coffin where he presented half a crown in hope of rendering the fates more propitious the usual ceremony was performed and the doctor addressed him in these words approach raven the captain advancing you ain't much mistaken brother said he heave your eye into the binnacle and box your compass you'll find i'm a crow not a raven though if indeed they be both fowls of a feather as the saying is i know it cried the conjurer thou art a northern crow a sea crow not a crow of prey but a crow to be preyed upon a crow to be plucked to be flayed to be basted to be broiled by marjorie upon the gridiron of matrimony the novice changing colour at this denunciation i do understand your signals brother said he and if it be set down in the log-book of fate that we must grapple well then where timbers but as i know how the land lies do you see and the current of my inclination sets me off i shall haul up close to the wind and mayhap we shall clear cape marjorie but howsomever we shall leave that reef in the foretop sail i was bound upon another voyage you see to look and to see and to know if so be as how i could pick up any intelligence along shore concerning my friend sir lancelot who slipped his cable last night and has lost company d'ye see what exclaimed the cunning man art thou a crow and canst not smell carrion if thou wouldst grieve for greaves behold his naked carcass lies unburied to feed the kites the crows the gulls the rooks and ravens what broach too dead as a boiled lobster odds heart friend these are the heaviest tidings i have heard these seven long years there must have been deadly odds when he lowered his topsails smite my eyes i'd rather the mufti had found it at sea with myself and all my generation on board well fare thy soul flower of the world had honest sam crow been within ale but what signifies palavering here the tears of unaffected sorrow flowed plentifully down the furrows of the seaman's cheeks then his grief giving way to his indignation hark ye brother conjurer said he you can spy foul weather before it comes in your eyes why did you not give us warning of this here squall bust my limbs i'll make ye give an account of this here damned horrid confounded murder d'ye see mayhap you yourself was concerned d'ye see for my part brother i put my trust in god and steer by the compass and i value not your poor wooing and your conjuration of a rope's end d'ye see the conjurer was by no means pleased either with the matter or the manner of this address he therefore began to soothe the captain's collar by representing that he did not pretend to omniscience which was the attribute of god alone that human art was fallible and imperfect and all that it could perform was to discover certain partial circumstances of any particular object to which its inquiries were directed that being questioned by the other man concerning the cause of his master's disappearing he had exercised his skill upon the subject and found reason to believe that sir lancelot was assassinated that he should think himself happy in being the instrument of bringing the murderers to justice though he foresaw they would of themselves save him that trouble for they would quarrel about dividing the spoil and one would give information against the other the prospect of this satisfaction appeased the resentment and in some measure 
mitigated the grief of Captain Crow, who took his leave without much ceremony, and being joined by Crabshaw, proceeded with a heavy heart to the house of Sir Lancelot, where they found the domestics at breakfast, without exhibiting the least symptom of concern for their absent master. Crow had been wise enough to conceal from Crabshaw what he had learned of the knight's fate. This fatal intelligence he reserved for the ear of his nephew, Mr. Clark, who did not fail to attend him in the forenoon. As for the squire, he did nothing but ruminate in rueful silence upon the dappled gelding, the nosegay, and the predicted fate of Gilbert. Him he forthwith visited in the stable, and saluted with the kiss of peace. Then he bemoaned his fortune with tears, and by the sound of his own lamentation was lulled asleep among the litter. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of the Life and Adventures of Sir Launcelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett Chapter twenty three in which the clouds that cover the catastrophe begin to disperse. We must now leave Captain Crow and his nephew, Mr. Clark, arguing with great vehemence about the fatal intelligence obtained from the conjurer, and penetrate at once the veil that concealed our hero. Know then, reader, that Sir Launcelot Greaves, repairing to the place described in the billet which he had received, was accosted by a person, muffled in a cloak, who began to amuse him with a feigned story of Aurelia, to which, while he listened with great attention, he found himself suddenly surrounded by armed men, who seized and pinioned down his arms, took away his sword, and conveyed him by force into a hackney coach, provided for the purpose. In vain he expostulated on this violence with three persons, who accompanied him in the vehicle. He could not extort one word by way of reply, and from their gloomy aspects he began to be apprehensive of assassination. Had the carriage passed through any frequented place, he would have endeavoured to alarm the inhabitants, but it was already clear of the town, and his conductors took care to avoid all villages and inhabited houses. After having travelled about two miles, the coach stopped at a large iron gate, which being opened, our adventurer was led in silence, through a spacious house, into a tolerably decent apartment, which he understood was intended for his bedchamber. In a few minutes after his arrival, he was visited by a man of no very prepossessing appearance, who, endeavouring to smooth his countenance, which was naturally stern, welcomed our adventurer to his house, exhorted him to be of good cheer, assuring him he should want for nothing, and desired to know what he would choose for supper. Sir Launcelot, in answer to this civil address, begged he would explain the nature of his confinement, and the reasons for which his arms were tied like those of the worst malefactor. The other postponed till to-morrow the explanation he demanded, but in the meantime unbound his fetters, and, as he declined eating, left him alone to his repose. He took care, however, in retiring, to double-lock the door of the room, whose windows were grated on the outside with iron. The knight, being thus abandoned to his own meditations, began to ruminate on the present adventure with equal surprise and concern. But the more he revolved circumstances, the more was he perplexed in his conjectures. According to the state of the mind, a very subtle philosopher is often puzzled by a very plain proposition, and this was the case of our adventurer. What made the strongest impression upon his mind was a notion that he was apprehended 
on suspicion of treasonable practices by a warrant from the secretary of state in consequence of some false malicious information and that his prison was no other than the house of a messenger set apart for the accommodation of suspected persons in this opinion he comforted himself by recollecting his own conscious innocence and reflecting that he should be entitled to the privilege of habeas corpus as the act including that inestimable jewel was happily not suspended at this time consoled by this self-assurance he quietly resigned himself to slumber but before he fell asleep he was very disagreeably undeceived in his conjecture his ears were all at once saluted with a noise from the next room conveyed in distinct bounces against the wainscot then a hoarse voice exclaimed bring up the artillery let brudendorff's brigade advance detach my black hussars to ravage the country let them be new booted take particular care of the spur leathers make a desert of lusatia bombard the suburbs of peria go tell my brother henry to pass the elbe at meissen with forty battalions and fifty squadrons so ho you major general donder why don't you finish your second parallel send hither the engineer schittenbach i'll lay all the shoes in my shop the breach will be practicable in four-and-twenty hours don't tell me of your works you and your works be damned assuredly cried another voice from a different quarter he that thinks to be saved by works is in a state of utter reprobation i myself was a profane weaver and trusted to the rottenness of works i kept my journeymen and prentices at constant work and my heart was set upon the riches of this world which was a wicked work but now i have got a glimpse of the new light i feel the operations of grace i am of the new birth i abhor good works i detest all working but the working of the spirit avaunt satan oh how i thirst for communication with our sister jolly the communication is already open with the marsh said the first but as for thee thou caitiff who has presumed to disparage my works i'll have thee rammed into a mortar with a double charge of powder and thrown into the enemy's quarters this dialogue operated like a train upon many other inhabitants of the place one swore he was within three vibrations of finding the longitude when this noise confounded his calculation a second in broken english complained he was distorped in the moment of deprojection a third in the character of his holiness denounced interdiction excommunication and anathemas and swore by st peter's keys they should howl ten thousand years in purgatory without the benefit of a single mass a fourth began to halloo in all the vociferation of a fox-hunter in the chase and in an instant the whole house was in uproar the clamour however was of a short duration the different chambers being opened successively every individual was effectually silenced by the sound of one cabalistic word which was no other than waistcoat a charm which at once cowed the king of p dispossessed the fanatic dumbfounded the mathematician dismayed the alchemist deposed the pope and deprived the squire of all utterance our adventurer was no longer in doubt concerning the place to which he had been conveyed and the more he reflected on his situation the more he was overwhelmed with the most perplexing chagrin he could not conceive by whose means he had been immured in a madhouse but he heartily repented of his knight errantry as a frolic which might have very serious consequences with respect to his future life and fortune after mature deliberation he resolved to demean himself with the utmost circumspection well knowing that every violent transport 
would be interpreted into an undeniable symptom of insanity. He was not without hope of being able to move his jailer by a due administration of that which is generally more efficacious than all the flowers of elocution. But when he rose in the morning, he found his pockets had been carefully examined and emptied of all his papers and cash. The keeper entering, he inquired about these particulars, and was given to understand that they were all safe deposited for his use to be forthcoming at a proper season. But at present, as he should want nothing, he had no occasion for money. The knight acquiesced in this declaration, and ate his breakfast in quiet. About eleven he received a visit from the physician, who contemplated his looks with great solemnity, and having examined his pulse, shook his head, saying, "'Well, sir, how do you do? Come, don't be dejected. Everything is for the best. You are in very good hands, sir, I assure you, and I dare say will refuse nothing that may be thought conducive to the recovery of your health. Doctor, said our hero, if it is not an improper question to ask, I should be glad to know your opinion of my disorder. Oh, sir, as to that, replied the physician, your disorder is a kind of a, sir, tis very common in this country, a sort of a, do you think my distemper is madness, doctor? Oh, Lord, sir, not absolute madness, no, not madness. You have heard, no doubt, of what is called a weakness of the nerves, sir, though that is a very inaccurate expression, for this phrase, denoting a morbid excess of sensation, seems to imply that sensation itself is owing to the loose cohesion of those material particles which constitute the nervous substance, inasmuch as the quantity of every effect must be proportional to its cause. Now you're pleased to take notice, sir, if the case were really what these words seem to import, all bodies, whose particles do not cohere with too great a degree of proximity, would be nervous, that is, endued with sensation. Sir, I shall order some cooling things to keep you in due temperature, and you'll do very well. Sir, your humble servant. So saying, he retired, and our adventurer could not but think it was very hard that one man should not dare to ask the most ordinary question without being reputed mad, while another should talk nonsense by the hour, and yet be esteemed as an oracle. The master of the house, finding Sir Lancelot so tame and tractable, indulged him after dinner with a walk in a little private garden, under the eye of a servant, who followed him at a distance. Here he was saluted by a brother prisoner, a man seemingly turned of thirty, tall and thin, with staring eyes, a hook nose, and a face covered with pimples. The usual compliments having passed, the stranger, without further ceremony, asked him if he would oblige him with a chew of tobacco, or could spare him a mouthful of any sort of cordial, declaring he had not tasted brandy since he came to the house. The knight assured him it was not in his power to comply with his request, and began to ask some questions relating to the character of their landlord which the stranger represented in very unfavourable colours. He described him as a ruffian, capable of undertaking the darkest scenes of villainy. He said his house was a repository of the most flagrant iniquities, that it contained fathers kidnapped by their children, wives confined by their husbands, gentlemen of fortune sequestered by their relations, and innocent persons immured by the malice of their adversaries. He affirmed this was his own case, and asked if our hero had never heard of Dick Distich, the poet and satirist. Ben Bullock and I, said he, were confident against the world in arms. Did you never see his ode to me beginning with fair blooming youth? 
we were sworn brothers admired and praised and quoted each other sir we denounced war against all the world actors authors and critics and having drawn the sword threw away the scabbard we pushed through thick and thin hacked and hewed helter-skelter and became as formidable to the writers of the age as the boeotian band of thebes my friend bullock indeed was once rolled in the kennel but soon he vigorous rose and from the fluvia strong imbibed new life and scarred and stunk along here is a satire which i wrote in an alehouse when i was drunk i can prove it by the evidence of the landlord and his wife i fancy you'll own i have some right to say with my friend horace qui me comorit melius non tangere clamo flebit et in signis tota cantabitur urbe the knight having perused the papers declared his opinion that the verses were tolerably good but at the same time observed that the author had reviled as ignorant dunces several persons who had writ with reputation and were generally allowed to have genius a circumstance that would detract more from his candour than could be allowed to his capacity damn their genius cried the satirist a pack of impertinent rascals i tell you sir ben bullock and i had determined to crush all that were not of our own party besides i said before this piece was written in drink was you drunk too when it was printed and published yes the printer shall make affidavit that i was never otherwise than drunk or maudlin till my enemies on pretence that my brain was turned conveyed me to this infernal mansion they seem to have been your best friends said the knight and have put the most tender interpretation on your conduct for waiving the plea of insanity your character must stand as that of a man who hath some small share of genius without an atom of integrity of all those whom pope lashed in his dunciad there was not one who did not richly deserve the imputation of dullness and every one of them had provoked the satirist by a personal attack in this respect the english poet was much more honest than his french pattern boileau who stigmatized several men of acknowledged genius such as quinault perrault and the celebrated lully for which reason every man of a liberal turn must in spite of all his poetical merit despise him as a rancorous knave if this disingenuous conduct cannot be forgiven in a writer of his superior genius who will pardon it in you whose name is not half emerged from obscurity hark ye friend replied the bard keep your pardon and your counsel for those who ask it or if you will force them upon people take one piece of advice in return if you don't like your present situation apply for a committee without delay they'll find you too much of a fool to have the least tincture of madness and you'll be released without further scruple in that case i shall rejoice in your deliverance you will be freed from confinement and i shall be happily deprived of your conversation so saying he flew off at a tangent and our knight could not help smiling at the peculiar virulence of his disposition sir launcelot then endeavoured to enter into conversation with his attendant by asking how long mr distich had resided in the house but he might as well have addressed himself to a turkish mute the fellow either pretended ignorance or refused an answer to every question that was proposed he would not even disclose the name of his landlord nor inform him whereabouts the house was situated finding himself agitated with impatience and indignation he returned to his apartment and the door being locked upon him began to review not without horror the particulars of his fate how little reason said he to himself have we to boast of the blessings enjoyed by the british subject 
if he holds them on such a precarious tenure if a man of rank and property may be thus kidnapped even in the midst of the capital if he may be seized by ruffians insulted robbed and conveyed to such a prison as this from which there seems to be no possibility of escape should i be indulged with pen ink and paper and appeal to my relations or to the magistrates of my country my letters would be intercepted by those who superintend my confinement should i try to alarm the neighbourhood my cries would be neglected as those of some unhappy lunatic under necessary correction should i employ the force which heaven has lent me i might imbrue my hands in blood and after all find it impossible to escape through a number of successive doors locks bolts and sentinels should i endeavour to tamper with the servant he might discover my design and then i should be abridged of the little comfort i enjoy people may inveigh against the bastille in france and the inquisition in portugal but i would ask if either of these be in reality so dangerous or dreadful as a private madhouse in england under the direction of a ruffian the bastille is a state prison the inquisition is a spiritual tribunal but both are under the direction of government it seldom if ever happens that a man entirely innocent is confined in either or if he should he lays his account with a legal trial before established judges but in england the most innocent person upon earth is liable to be immured for life under the pretext of lunacy sequestered from his wife children and friends robbed of his fortune deprived even of necessaries and subjected to the most brutal treatment from a low-bred barbarian who raises an ample fortune on the misery of his fellow creatures and may during his whole life practise this horrid oppression without question or control this uncomfortable reverie was interrupted by a very unexpected sound that seemed to issue from the other side of a thick party wall it was a strain of vocal music more plaintive than the widowed turtle's moan more sweet and ravishing than philomel's love warbled song through his ear it instantly pierced into his heart for at once he recognized it to be the voice of his adored aurelia heavens what was the agitation of his soul when he made this discovery how did every nerve quiver how did his heart throb with the most violent emotion he ran round the room in distraction foaming like a lion in the toil then he placed his ear close to the partition and listened as if his whole soul was exerted in his sense of hearing when the sound ceased to vibrate on his ear he threw himself on the bed he groaned with anguish he exclaimed in broken accents and in all probability his heart would have burst had not the violence of his sorrow found vent in a flood of tears these first transports were succeeded by a fit of impatience which had well nigh deprived him of his senses in good earnest his surprise at finding his lost aurelia in such a place the seeming impossibility of relieving her and his unspeakable eagerness to contrive some scheme for profiting by the interesting discovery he had made concurred in brewing up a second ecstasy during which he acted a thousand extravagances which it was well for him the attendants did not observe perhaps it was well for the servant that he did not enter while the paroxysm prevailed had this been the case he might have met with the fate of lycus whom hercules in his frenzy destroyed before the cloth was laid for supper he was calm enough to conceal the disorder of his mind but he complained of the headache and desired he might be next day visited by the physician to whom he resolved to explain himself in such a manner as should make an impression upon him 
provided he was not altogether destitute of conscience and humanity. End of chapter 23「twenty four of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter twenty four. The knot that puzzles human wisdom, the hand of fortune sometimes will untie, familiar as her garter. When the doctor made his next appearance in Sir Lancelot's apartment, the knight addressed him in these words. Sir, the practice of medicine is one of the most honourable professions exercised among the sons of men a profession which hath been revered at all periods and in all nations and even held sacred in the most polished ages of antiquity the scope of it is to preserve the being and confirm the health of our fellow creatures of consequence to sustain the blessings of society and crown life with fruition the character of a physician therefore not only supposes natural sagacity and acquired erudition but it also implies every delicacy of sentiment every tenderness of nature and every virtue of humanity that these qualities are centred in you doctor i would willingly believe but it will be sufficient for my purpose that you are possessed of common integrity to whose concern i am indebted for your visits you best know but if you understand the art of medicine you must be sensible by this time that with respect to me your prescriptions are altogether unnecessary come sir you cannot you don't believe that my intellects are disordered yet granting me to be really under the influence of that deplorable malady no person has a right to treat me as a lunatic or to sue out a commission but my nearest kindred that you may not plead ignorance of my name and family, you shall understand that I am Sir Lancelot Greaves, of the county of York, Baronet, and that my nearest relation is Sir Reginald Meadows of Cheshire, the eldest son of my mother's sister. That gentleman, I am sure, had no concern in seducing me by false pretences under the clouds of night into the fields, where I was surprised, overpowered and kidnapped by armed ruffians had he really believed me insane he would have proceeded according to the dictates of honour humanity and the laws of his country situated as i am i have a right by making application to the lord chancellor to be tried by a jury of honest men but of that right i cannot avail myself while i remain at the mercy of a brutal miscreant in whose house i am enclosed unless you contribute your assistance your assistance therefore i demand as you are a gentleman a christian and a fellow-subject who though every other motive should be overlooked ought to interest himself in my case as a common concern and concur with all your power towards the punishment of those who dare commit such outrages against the liberty of your country the doctor seemed to be a little disconcerted but after some recollection resumed his air of sufficiency and importance and assured our adventurer he would do him all the service in his power but in the meantime advised him to take the potion he had prescribed the knight's eyes lightening with indignation i am now convinced cried he that you are an accomplice in the villainy which has been practised upon me that you are a sordid wretch without principle or feeling a disgrace to the faculty and a reproach to human nature yes sirrah you are the most perfidious of all assassins 
you are the harling minister of the worst of all villains who from motives even baser than malice envy and revenge rob the innocent of all the comforts of life brand them with the imputation of madness the most cruel species of slander and wantonly protract their misery by leaving them in the most shocking confinement a prey to reflections infinitely more bitter than death but i will be calm do me justice at your peril i demand the protection of the legislature if i am refused remember a day of reckoning will come you and the rest of the miscreants who have combined against me must in order to cloak your treachery have recourse to murder an expedient which i believe you very capable of embracing or a man of my rank and character cannot be much longer concealed tremble caitiff at the thoughts of my release in the meantime be gone lest my just resentment impel me to dash your brains out upon that marble away the honest doctor was not so firmly persuaded of his patient's lunacy as to reject his advice which he made what haste he could to follow when an unexpected accident intervened that this may be properly introduced we must return to the knight's brace of trusty friends captain crow and lawyer clark whom we left in sorrowful deliberation upon the fate of their patron clark's genius being rather more fruitful in resources than that of the seaman he suggested an advertisement which was accordingly inserted in the daily papers importing that whereas a gentleman of considerable rank and fortune has suddenly disappeared on such a night from his house near golden square in consequence of a letter delivered to him by a porter and there is great reason to believe some violence hath been offered to his life any person capable of giving such information as may tend to clear up this dark transaction shall by applying to mr thomas clark attorney at his lodgings in upper brook street receive proper security for the reward of one hundred guineas to be paid to him upon his making the discovery required the porter who delivered the letter appeared accordingly but could give no other information except that it was put into his hand with a shilling by a man muffled up in a greatcoat who stopped him for the purpose in his passing through queen street it was necessary that the advertisement should produce an effect upon another person who was no other than the hackney coachman who drove our hero to the place of his imprisonment this fellow had been enjoined secrecy and indeed bribed to hold his tongue by a considerable gratification which it was supposed would have been effectual as the man was a master coachman in good circumstances and well known to the keeper of the madhouse by whom he had been employed on former occasions of the same nature perhaps his fidelity to his employer reinforced by the hope of many future jobs of that kind might have been proof against the offer of fifty pounds but double that sum was a temptation he could not resist he no sooner read the intimation in the daily advertiser over his morning's pot at an alehouse than he entered into consultation with his own thoughts and having no reason to doubt that this was the very fare he had conveyed he resolved to earn the reward and abstain from all such adventures in time coming he had the precaution however to take an attorney along with him to mr clark who entered into a conditional bond and with the assistance of his uncle deposited the money to be forthcoming when the conditions should be fulfilled these previous measures being taken the coachman declared what he knew and discovered the house in which sir launcelot had been immured he moreover accompanied our two adherents to a judge's chamber where he made oath to the truth of his information and a warrant was immediately granted to search the house of bernard shackle and set at liberty sir launcelot greaves if they are found 
fortified with this authority they engaged a constable with a formidable posse and embarking them in coaches repaired with all possible expedition to the house of mr shackle who did not think proper to dispute their claim but admitted them though not without betraying evident symptoms of consternation one of the servants directing them by his master's order to sir lancelot's apartment they hurried upstairs in a body occasioning such a noise as did not fail to alarm the physician who had just opened the door to retire when he perceived their eruption captain crow conjecturing he was guilty from the confusion that appeared in his countenance made no scruple of seizing him by the collar as he endeavoured to retreat while the tender-hearted tom clark running up to the knight with his eyes brimful of joy and affection forgot all the forms of distant respect and throwing his arms round his neck blubbered in his bosom our hero did not receive this proof of attachment unmoved he strained him in his embrace honoured him with the title of his deliverer and asked him by what miracle he had discovered the place of his confinement the lawyer began to unfold the various steps he had taken with equal minuteness and self-complacency when crow dragging the doctor still by the collar shook his old friend by the hand protesting he was never so overjoyed since he got clear of a sally rover on the coast of barbary and that two glasses ago he would have started all the money he had in the world in the hold of any man who would have shown sir lancelot safe at his moorings the knight having made a proper return to this sincere manifestation of goodwill desired him to dismiss that worthless fellow meaning the doctor who finding himself released withdrew with some precipitation then our adventurer attended by his friends walked off with a deliberate pace to the outward gate which he found open and getting into one of the coaches was entertained by the way to his own house with a detail of every measure which had been pursued for his release in his own parlour he found mrs dolly cowslip who had been waiting with great fear and impatience for the issue of mr clark's adventure she now fell upon her knees and bathed the knight's hands with tears of joy while the face of this young woman recalling the idea of her mistress roused his heart to strong emotions and stimulated his mind to the immediate achievement he had already planned as for mr crabshaw he was not the last to signify his satisfaction at his master's return after having kissed the hem of his garment he retired to the stable where he communicated these tidings to his friend gilbert whom he saddled and bridled the same office he performed for bronza marte then putting on his squire-like attire and accoutrements he mounted one and led the other to the knight's door before which he paraded uttering from time to time repeated shouts to the no small entertainment of the populace until he received orders to house his companions thus commanded he led them back to their stalls resumed his livery and rejoined his fellow-servants who were resolved to celebrate the day with banquets and rejoicings their master's heart was not sufficiently at ease to share in their festivity he held a consultation with his friends in the parlour whom he acquainted with the reasons he had to believe miss darnell was confined in the same house which had been his prison a circumstance which filled them with equal pleasure and astonishment dolly in particular weeping plentifully conjured him to deliver her dear lady without delay nothing now remained but to concert the plan for her deliverance as aurelia had informed dolly of her connection with mrs cordle at whose house she proposed to lodge before she was overtaken on the road by her uncle this particular was now imparted to the council and struck a light 
which seemed to point out the direct way to Miss Darnell's enlargement. Our hero, accompanied by Mrs. Cowslip and Tom Clark, set out immediately for the house of Dr. Cordell, who happened to be abroad, but his wife received them with great courtesy. She was a well-bred, sensible, genteel woman, and strongly attached to Aurelia by the ties of affection, as well as of consanguinity. She no sooner learned the situation of her cousin than she expressed the most impatient concern for her being set at liberty, and assured Sir Launcelot she would concur in any scheme he should propose for that purpose. There was no room for hesitation or choice. He attended her immediately to the judge, who, upon proper application, issued another search warrant for Aurelia Darnell. The constable and his posse were again retained, and Sir Launcelot Greaves once more crossed the threshold of Mr. Bernard Shackle. Nor was the search warrant the only implement of justice with which he had furnished himself for this visit. In going thither they agreed upon the method in which they should introduce themselves gradually to Miss Darnell, that her tender nature might not be too much shocked by their sudden appearance. When they arrived at the house, therefore, and produced their credentials, in consequence of which a female attendant was directed to show the lady's apartment, Mrs. Dolly first entered the chamber of the accomplished Aurelia, who, lifting up her eyes, screamed aloud and flew into the arms of her faithful cowslip. Some minutes elapsed before Dolly could make shift to exclaim, "'I'm come to live and die with my beloved lady!' "'Dear Dolly!' cried her mistress. "'I cannot express the pleasure I have in seeing you again. "'Good heaven! "'What solitary hours of keen affliction have I passed since we parted! "'But tell me, how did you discover the place of my retreat? "'Has my uncle relented? "'Do I owe your coming to his indulgence?' "'Dolly answered in the negative.' and by degrees gave her to understand that her cousin, Mrs. Cordell, was in the next room. That lady immediately appeared, and a very tender scene of recognition passed between the two relations. It was she who, in the course of conversation, perceiving that Aurelia was perfectly composed, declared the happy tidings of her approaching deliverance. When the other eagerly insisted upon knowing to whose humanity and address she was indebted for this happy turn of fortune, her cousin declared the obligation was due to a young gentleman of Yorkshire called Sir Launcelot Greaves. At mention of that name, her face was overspread with a crimson glow, and her eyes beamed redoubled splendour. Cousin, said she with a sigh, I know not what to say. That gentleman, Sir Launcelot Greaves, was surely born. Lord bless me, I tell you, cousin, he has been my guardian angel. Mrs. Cordell, who had maintained a correspondence with her by letters, was no stranger to the former part of the connection subsisting between those two lovers, and had always favoured the pretensions of our hero without being acquainted with his person. She now observed with a smile that as Aurelia esteemed the knight her guardian angel, and he adored her as a demi-deity, nature seemed to have intended them for each other. For such sublime ideas exalted them both above the sphere of ordinary mortals. She then ventured to intimate that he was in the house, impatient to pay his respects in person. At this declaration, the colour vanished from her cheeks, which, however, soon underwent a total suffusion. Her heart panted, her bosom heaved, and her gentle frame was agitated by transports rather violent than unpleasing. She soon, however, recollected herself, and her native serenity returned. When, rising from her seat, she declared she would see him in the next apartment, where he stood in the most tumultuous suspense, waiting for permission to approach her person. Here she broke in upon him, arrayed in an elegant white undress, the emblem of her purity, 
beaming forth the emanations of amazing beauty, warmed and improved with a glow of gratitude and affection. His heart was too big for utterance. He ran towards her with rapture, and throwing himself at her feet, imprinted a most respectful kiss upon her lily hand. "'This, divine Aurelia,' cried he, "'is a foretaste of that ineffable bliss which you were born to bestow. Do I then live to see you smile again, to see you restored to liberty, your mind at ease, and your health unimpaired? You have lived, said she, to see my obligations to Sir Lancelot Greaves accumulated in such a manner that a whole life spent in acknowledgment will scarce suffice to demonstrate a due sense of his goodness. You greatly overrate my services, which have been rather the duties of common humanity than the efforts of a generous passion, too noble to be thus evinced. But let not my unseasonable transports detain you a moment longer on this detested scene. Give me leave to hand you into the coach, and commit you to the care of this good lady, attended by this honest young gentleman, who is my particular friend. So saying, he presented Mr. Thomas Clark, who had the honour to salute the fair hand of the ever amiable Aurelia. The ladies being safely coached under the escort of the lawyer, Sir Lancelot assured them he should wait on them in the evening at the house of Dr. Cordell, whither they immediately directed their course. Our hero, who remained with the constable and his gang, inquired for Mr. Bernard Shackle, upon whose person he intended to serve a writ of conspiracy over and above a prosecution for robbery, in consequence of his having disencumbered the knight of his money and other effects on the first night of his confinement. Mr. Shackle had discretion enough to avoid this encounter, and even to anticipate the indictment for felony, by directing one of his servants to restore the cash and papers, which our adventurer accordingly received before he quitted the house. In the prosecution of his search after Shackle, he chanced to enter the chamber of the bard, whom he found in dishabillé, writing at a table, with a bandage over one eye, and his head covered with a nightcap of bays. The knight, having made an apology for this intrusion, desired to know if he could be of any service to Mr. Distich, as he was now at liberty to use the little influence he had for the relief of his fellow sufferers. The poet, having eyed him for some time askance, "'I told you,' said he, "'your stay in this place would be of short duration. "'I have sustained a small disaster on my left eye "'from the hands of a rascally cordwainer "'who pretends to believe himself the King of Prussia, "'and I am now in the very act of galling His Majesty "'with keen iambies. "'If you can help me to a roll of tobacco "'and a bottle of Geneva, so.' If you are not so inclined, your humble servant, I shall share in the joy of your deliverance. The knight declined gratifying him in these particulars, which he apprehended might be prejudicial to his health, but offered his assistance in redressing his grievances, provided he laboured under any cruel treatment or inconvenience. I comprehend the full extent of your generosity, replied the satirist. You are willing to assist me in everything, except the only circumstances in which assistance is required. God be with you. If you see Ben Bullock, tell him I wish he would not dedicate any more of his works to me. Damn the fellow! He has changed his note, and begins to snivel. For my part, I stick to my former maxim, defy all the world, and will die hard, even if death should be preceded by damnation." The knight, finding him incorrigible, left him to the slender chance of being one day comforted by the dram-bottle, but resolved, if possible, to set on foot an accurate inquiry into the economy and transactions of this private inquisition, that ample justice might be done in favour of every injured individual confined within its walls. 
in the afternoon he did not fail to visit his aurelia and all the protestations of their mutual passion were once more interchanged he now produced the letter which had caused such fatal disquiet in his bosom and miss darnell no sooner eyed the paper than she recollected it was a formal dismission which she had intended and directed for mr sycamore this the uncle had intercepted and cunningly enclosed in another cover addressed to sir lancelot greaves who was now astonished beyond measure to see the mystery so easily unfolded the joy that now diffused itself in the hearts of our lovers is more easily conceived than described but in order to give a stability to this mutual satisfaction it was necessary that aurelia should be secured from the tyranny of her uncle whose power of guardianship would not otherwise expire for some months dr caudle and his lady having entered into their deliberations on the subject it was agreed that miss darnell should have recourse to the protection of the lord chancellor but such application was rendered unnecessary by the unexpected arrival of john clump with the following letter to mrs caudle from the steward of anthony darnell dated at aurelia's house in the country madam it hath pleased god to afflict mr darnell with a severe stroke of the dead palsy he was taken ill yesterday and now lies insensible seemingly at the point of death among the papers in his pocket i found the enclosed by which it appears that my honoured young lady miss darnell is confined in a private madhouse i am afraid mr darnell's fate is a just judgment of god upon him for his cruelty to that excellent person i need not exhort you madam to take immediately upon the receipt of this such measures as will be necessary for the enlargement of my poor young lady in the meantime i shall do the needful for the preservation of her property in this place and send you an account of any further alteration that may happen being very respectfully madam your most obedient humble servant ralph mattox clump had posted up to london with this intimation on the wings of love and being covered with clay from the heels to the eyes upwards he appeared in such an unfavourable light at dr caudle's door that the footman refused him admittance nevertheless he pushed him aside and fought his way upstairs into the dining-room where the company was not a little astonished at such an apparition the fellow himself was no less amazed at seeing aurelia and his own sweetheart mrs dolly cowslip he forthwith fell upon his knees and in silence held out the letter which was taken by the doctor and presented to his wife according to the direction she did not fail to communicate the contents which were far from being unwelcome to the individuals who composed this little society mr clump was honoured with the approbation of his young lady who commended him for his zeal and expedition bestowed upon him a handsome gratuity in the meantime and desired to see him again when he should be properly refreshed after the fatigue he had undergone mr thomas clark being consulted on this occasion gave it as his opinion that miss darnell should without delay choose another guardian for the few months that remained of her minority the opinion was confirmed by the advice of some eminent lawyers to whom immediate recourse was had and dr caudle being the person pitched upon for this office the necessary forms were executed with all possible dispatch the first use the doctor made of his guardianship was to sign a power constituting mr ralph mattox his attorney pro tempore for managing the estate of miss aurelia darnell and this was forwarded to the steward by the hands of clump who set out with it for the seat of darnell hill though not without a heavy heart occasioned by some intimation he had received concerning the connection between his dear dolly and mr clark the lawyer 
End of chapter 24Chapter the Last of the Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. The Life and Adventures of Sir Lancelot Greaves by Tobias Smollett. Chapter the Last. Which, it is to be hoped, will be on more accounts than one, agreeable to the reader. Sir Lancelot, having vindicated the liberty, confirmed the safety, and secured the heart of his charming Aurelia, now found leisure to unravel the conspiracy which had been executed against his person, and with that view commenced a lawsuit against the owner of the house where he and his mistress had been separately confined. Mr. Shackle was, notwithstanding all the submissions and atonement which he offered to make, either in private or in public, indicted on the statute of kidnapping, tried, convicted, punished by a severe fine, and standing in the pillory. A judicial writ ad inquirendum being executed, the prisons of his inquisition were laid open, and several innocent captives enlarged. In the course of Shackle's trial, it appeared that the knight's confinement was a scheme executed by his rival, Mr. Sycamore, according to the device of his counsellor, Dordle, who, by this contrivance, had reconciled himself to his patron, after having deserted him in the day of battle. Our hero was so incensed at this discovery of Sycamore's treachery and ingratitude, that he went in quest of him immediately, to take vengeance on his person, accompanied by Captain Crow, who wanted to balance accounts with Mr. Dordle. But those gentlemen had wisely avoided the impending storm by retiring to the continent on pretence of travelling for improvement. Sir Lancelot was not now so much of a knight-errant as to leave Aurelia to the care of Providence and pursue the traitors to the farthest extremities of the earth, he practised a much more easy, certain, and effectual method of revenge, by instituting a process against them which, which, after writs of Capius, alias et pluris had been repeated, subjected them both to outlawry. Mr. Sycamore and his friend, being thus deprived of the benefit of the law by their own neglect, would likewise have forfeited their goods and chattels to the king, had they not made such submissions as appeased the wrath of Sir Lancelot and Captain Crow. Then they ventured to return, and by dint of interest obtained a reversal of the outlawry. But this grace they did not enjoy till long after our adventurer was happily established in life. While the knight waited impatiently for the expiration of Aurelia's minority, and in the meantime consoled himself with the imperfect happiness arising from her conversation, and those indulgences which the most unblemished virtue could bestow, Captain Crow projected another plan of vengeance against the conjurer, whose lying oracles had cost him such a world of vexation. The truth is, the captain began to be tired of idleness, and undertook this adventure to keep his hand in use. He imparted his design to Crabshaw, who had likewise suffered in spirit, from the predictions of the said offender, and was extremely well disposed to assist in punishing the false prophet. He now took it for granted that he should not be hanged for stealing a horse, and thought it very hard to pay so much money for a deceitful prophecy, which, in all likelihood, would never be fulfilled. Actuated by these motives, they set out together for the House of Consultation but they found it shut up and abandoned, and, upon inquiry in the neighbourhood, learned that the conjurer had moved his quarters that very day on which the captain had recourse to his art. This was actually the case. He knew the fate of Sir Lancelot would soon come to light, and he did not choose to wait the consequence. He had other motives for decamping. He had run a score at the public house, which he had no mind to discharge, 
and wanted to disengage himself from his female associate, who knew too much of his affairs to be kept at a proper distance. All these purposes he had answered by retreating softly, without beat of drum, while his sibyl was abroad running down prey for his devouring. He had not, however, taken his measures so cunningly, but that this old hag discovered his new lodgings, and in revenge gave information to the publican. This creditor took out a writ accordingly, and the bailiff had just secured his person, as Captain Crow and Timothy Crabshaw chanced to pass by the door in their way homewards through an obscure street near the Seven Dials. The conjurer, having no subterfuge left, but a great many particular reasons for avoiding an explanation with the justice, like the man between the devil and the deep blue sea, of two evils chose the least, and beckoning to the captain, called him by his name. Crow, thus addressed, replied with a hloa, and looking towards the place from whence he was hailed, at once recognised the necromancer. Without farther hesitation, he sprang across the street, and collaring al exclaimed, Aha! Old boy, is the wind in that corner? I thought we should grapple one day. Now will I bring you up by the head, though all the devils in hell were blowing abaft the beam. The bailiff, seeing his prisoner so rough-handled before, and at the same time assaulted behind by Crabshaw, who cried, Show me a liar, and I'll show you a thief. Who is to be hanged now, I say? The bailiff, fearing he should lose the benefit of his job, began to put on his contentious face, and declaring the doctor was his prisoner, swore he could not surrender him without a warrant from the Lord Chief Justice. The whole group adjourning into the parlour, the conjurer desired to know of Crow where the Sir Lancelot was found. Being answered, "'Hey, hey, safe enough to see you made fast in the bilbos, brother!' He told the captain he had something of consequence to communicate for his advantage, and proposed that Crow and Crabshaw should bail the action, which lay only for a debt of three pounds. Crow stormed, and Crabshaw grinned at this modest proposal, but when they understood that they could only be bound for his appearance, and reflected that they need not part with him until his body should be surrendered unto justice, they consented to give bail, and the bond being executed, conveyed him directly to the house of our adventurer. The boisterous crow introduced him to Sir Lancelot, with such an abrupt, unconnected detail of his offence, as the knight could not understand without Timothy's annotations. These were followed by some questions put to the conjurer, who, laying aside his black gown and plucking off his white beard, exhibited to the astonished spectators the very individual countenance of the empirical politician Ferret, who had played our hero such a slippery trick after the electioneering adventure. "'I perceive,' said he, "'you are preparing to expostulate and upbraid me for having given a false information against you to the country justice. I look upon mankind to be in a state of nature, a truth which Hobbes has stumbled upon by accident. I think every man has a right to avail himself of his talents, even at the expense of his fellow creatures, just as we see the fish and other animals of the creation devouring one another. I found the justice but one degree removed from idiotism, and knowing that he would commit some blunder in the execution of his office, which would lay him at your mercy, I contrived to make his folly the instrument of my escape. I was dismissed without being obliged to sign the information I had given, and you took ample vengeance for his tyranny and impertinence. I came to London, where my circumstances obliged me to live in disguise. In the character of a conjurer, I was consulted by your follower Crow and your squire Crabshaw. I did little or nothing but echo back the intelligence they brought me, except prognosticating that Crabshaw would be hanged, a prediction to which I found myself so irresistibly impelled that I am persuaded it was the real effect of inspiration. 
I am now arrested for a paltry sum of money, and moreover liable to be sent to Bridewell as an impostor. Let those answer for my conduct whose cruelty and insolence have driven me to the necessity of using such subterfuges. I have been oppressed and persecuted by the government for speaking truth. Your omnipotent laws have reconciled contradictions. That which is acknowledged to be truth in fact is construed falsehood in law, and great reason we have to boast of a constitution founded on the basis of absurdity. But, waving these remarks, I own I am unwilling to be either imprisoned for debt or punished for imposture. I know how far to depend upon generosity and what is called benevolence, words to amuse the weak-minded. I build upon a surer bottom. I will bargain for your assistance. It is in my power to put twelve thousand pounds in the pocket of Samuel Crow, that there sea ruffian, who by his good will would hang me to the yard's arm. There he was interrupted by the seaman. Damn your rat's eyes, none of your hang thee! Fish my topmasts! If the rope was fairly reeved and the tackle sound, you see? Mr. Clark, who was present, began to stare, while the knight assured Ferret that if he was really able and willing to serve Captain Crow in anything essential, he should be amply rewarded. In the meantime, he discharged the debt and assigned him an apartment in his own house. That same day Crow, by the advice of Sir Lancelot and his nephew, entered into conditional articles with the cynic to allow him the interest of fifteen hundred pounds for life, provided by this means the captain should obtain possession of the estate of Hobby Hole in Yorkshire, which had belonged to his grandfather, and of which he was heir of blood. This bond being executed, Mr. Ferret discovered that he himself was the lawful husband of Bridget Maple, aunt to Samuel Crow, by a clandestine marriage, which, however, he convinced them he could prove by undeniable evidence. This being the case, she, the said Bridget Maple, alias Ferret, was a covert femme, consequently could not transact any deed of alienation without his concurrence. Ergo, the docking of the entail of the estate of Hobby Hole was illegal and of none effect. This was a very agreeable declaration to the whole company, who did not fail to congratulate Captain Crow on the prospect of his being restored to his inheritance. Tom Clark in particular protested, with tears in his eyes, that it gave him unspeakable joy, and his tears trickled the faster, when Crow, with an arch look, signified that now he was pretty well victualled for life, he had some thoughts of embarking on the voyage of matrimony. But that point of happiness to which, as the North Pole, the course of these adventures hath been invariably directed, was still unattained. We mean the indissoluble union of the accomplished Sir Lancelot Greaves and the enchanting Miss Darnell. Our hero now discovered in his mistress a thousand charms which hitherto he had no opportunity to contemplate. He found her beauty excelled by her good sense and her virtue superior to both. He found her untainted by that giddiness, vanity and affectation which distinguish the fashionable females of the present age. He found her uninfected by the rage for diversion and dissipation, for noise, tumult, gewgaws, glitter and extravagance. He found her not only raised by understanding and taste far above the amusement of little vulgar minds, but even exalted by uncommon genius and refined reflection, so as to relish the more sublime enjoyments of rational pleasure. He found her possessed of that vigour of mind which constitutes true fortitude and vindicates the empire of reason. He found her heart incapable of disguise or dissimulation, frank, generous and open, susceptible of the most tender impressions, glowing with a keen sense of honour and melting with humanity. A youth of his sensibility could not fail of being deeply affected by such attractions. 
the nearer he approached the centre of happiness the more did the velocity of his passion increase her uncle still remained insensible as it were in the arms of death time seemed to linger in its lapse till the night was inflamed to the most eager degree of impatience he communicated his distress to aurelia he pressed her with the most pathetic remonstrances to abridge the torture of his suspense he interested mrs cordell in his behalf and at length his importunities succeeded the bands of marriage were regularly published and the ceremony was performed in the parish church in the presence of dr cordell and his lady captain crow lawyer clark and mrs dolly cowslip the bride instead of being disguised in tawdry stuffs of gold and silver and sweating under a harness of diamonds according to the elegant taste of the times appeared in a negligee of plain blue satin without any other jewels than her eyes which far outshone all that ever was produced by the minds of golconda her hair had no other extraneous ornament than a small sprig of artificial roses but the dignity of her air the elegance of her shape the sweetness and sensibility of her countenance added to such warmth of colouring and such exquisite symmetry of features as could not be excelled by human nature attracted the eyes and excited the admiration of all the beholders the effect they produced in the heart of sir lancelot was such a rapture as we cannot pretend to describe he made his appearance on this occasion in a white coat and blue satin vest both embroidered with silver and all who saw him could not but own that he alone seemed worthy to possess the lady whom heaven had destined for his consort captain crow had taken off a blue suit of clothes strongly guarded with bars of broad gold lace in order to honour the nuptials of his friend he wore upon his head a bag wig a la pigeon made by an old acquaintance in wapping and to his side he had girded a huge plate-hilted sword which he had bought of a recruiting sergeant mr clark was dressed in pompadour with gold buttons and his lovely dolly in a smart checked lute string a present from her mistress the whole company dined by invitation at the house of dr cordell and here it was that the most deserving lovers on the face of the earth attained to the consummation of all earthly felicity the captain and his nephew had a hint to retire in due time mrs cordell conducted the amiable aurelia trembling to the marriage bed our hero glowing with a bridegroom's ardour claimed the husband's privilege hymen lighted up his brightest torch at virtue's lamp and every star shed its happiest influence on their heaven-directed union instructions had been already dispatched to prepare grevesbury hall for the reception of its new mistress and for that place the new married couple set out next morning according to the plan which had been previously concerted sir lancelot and lady greaves accompanied by mrs cordell and attended by dolly travelled in their own coach drawn by six dappled horses dr cordell with captain crow occupied the doctor's post chariot provided with four bays mr clark had the honour to bestride the loins of bronza marte mr ferret was mounted upon an old hunter crabshaw stuck close to his friend gilbert and two other horsemen completed the retinue there was not an aching heart in the whole cavalcade except that of the young lawyer which was by turns invaded with hot desires and chilling scruples though he was fond of dolly to distraction his regard to worldly reputation and his attention to worldly interest were continually raising up bars to a legal gratification of his love his pride was startled at the thought of marrying the daughter of a poor country publican and he moreover dreaded the resentment of his uncle crow should he take any step of this nature without his concurrence many a wishful look did he cast at dolly 
the tears standing in his eyes and many a woeful sigh did he utter lady greaves immediately perceived the situation of his heart and by questioning mrs cowslip discovered a mutual passion between these lovers she consulted her dear knight on the subject and he catechised the lawyer who pleaded guilty the captain being sounded as to his opinion declared he would be steered in that as well as every other course of life by sir lancelot and his lady whom he verily revered as being of an order superior to the ordinary race of mankind this favourable response being obtained from the sailor our hero took an opportunity on the road one day after dinner in presence of the whole company to accost the lawyer in these words my good friend clark i have your happiness very much at heart your father was an honest man to whom my family had manifold obligations i have had these many years a personal regard for yourself derived from your own integrity of heart and goodness of disposition i see you are affected and shall be brief besides this regard i am indebted to your friendship for the liberty what shall i say for the inestimable happiness i now enjoy in possessing the most excellent but i understand that significant glance of my aurelia i will not offend her delicacy the truth is my obligation is very great and it is time i should evince my gratitude if the stewardship of my estate is worth your acceptance you shall have it immediately together with the house and farm of cockerton in my neighbourhood i know you have a passion for mrs dolly and believe she looks upon you with the eyes of tender prepossession don't blush dolly besides your agreeable person which all the world must approve you can boast of virtue fidelity and friendship your attachment to lady greaves neither she nor i shall ever forget if you are willing to unite your fate with mr clark your mistress gives me leave to assure you she will stop the farm at her own expense and we will celebrate the wedding at greavesbury hall by this time the hearts of these grateful lovers had overflowed dolly was sitting on her knees bathing her lady's hand with her tears and mr clark appeared in the same attitude by sir lancelot the uncle almost as affected as the nephew by the generosity of our adventurer cried aloud i pray god that you and your glorious concert may have smooth seas and gentle gales whithersoever you are bound as for my kinsman tom i'll give him a thousand pounds to set him fairly afloat and if he prove not a faithful tender to you his benefactor i hope he will founder in this world and be damned in that which is to come nothing now was wanting to the completion of their happiness but the consent of dolly's mother at the black lion whom they did not suppose could have any objection to such an advantageous match for her daughter but in this particular they were mistaken in the meantime they arrived at the village where the knight had exercised the duties of chivalry and there he received the gratulation of mr Fillet and the attorney who had offered to bail him before justice gobble mutual civilities having passed they gave him to understand that gobble and his wife were turned methodists all the rest of the prisoners whom he had delivered came to testify their gratitude and were hospitably entertained next day they halted at the black lion where the good woman was overjoyed to see dolly so happily preferred but when sir lancelot unfolded the proposed marriage she interrupted him with a scream christ jesus forbid marry an amen batch with her own brother at this exclamation dolly fainted her lover stood with his ears erect and his mouth wide open crow stared while the knight and his lady expressed equal surprise and concern when sir lancelot entreated mrs cowslip to explain this mystery she told him that about sixteen years ago mr clark senior had brought dolly then an infant to her house when she and her late husband lived in another part of the country and as she had then been lately delivered of a child which did not live he hired her as a nurse to the little foundling 
he owned she was a love-begotten babe and from time to time paid handsomely for the board of dolly who he desired might pass for her own daughter in his last illness he assured her he had taken care to provide for the child but since his death she had received no account of any such provision she moreover informed his honour that mr clark had deposited in her hands a diamond ring and a sealed paper never to be opened without his order until dolly should be demanded in marriage by the man she should like and not then except in the presence of the clergyman of the parish send for the clergyman this instant cried our hero reddening and fixing his eyes on dolly i hope all will yet be well the vicar arriving and being made acquainted with the nature of the case the landlady produced the paper which being opened appeared to be an authentic certificate that the person commonly known by the name of dorothy cowslip was in fact dorothy greaves daughter of jonathan greaves esq by a young gentlewoman who had been some years deceased the remaining part of the mystery i myself can unfold exclaimed the knight while he ran and embraced the astonished dolly as his kinswoman jonathan greaves was my uncle and died before he came of age so that he could make no settlement on his child the fruit of a private amour founded on a promise of marriage of which this ring was a token mr clark being his confidant disposed of the child and at length finding his constitution decay revealed the secret to my father who in his will bequeathed one hundred pounds a year to this agreeable foundling but as they both died while i was abroad and some of the memorandums touching this transaction probably were mislaid i never till now could discover where or how my pretty cousin was situated i shall recompense the good woman for her care and fidelity and take pleasure in bringing this affair to a happy issue the lovers were now overwhelmed with transports of joy and gratitude and every countenance was lighted up with satisfaction from this place to the habitation of sir lancelot the bells were rung in every parish and the corporation in their formalities congratulated him in every town through which he passed about five miles from grevesbury hall he was met by above five thousand persons of both sexes and every age dressed out in their gayest apparel headed by mr ralph mattox from darnell hill and the rector from the knight's own parish they were preceded by music of different kinds ranged under a great variety of flags and ensigns and the women as well as the men bedizened with fancy knots and marriage favours at the end of the avenue a select bevy of comely virgins arrayed in white and a separate band of choice youths distinguished by garlands of laurel and holly interweaved fell into the procession and sung in chorus a rustic epithalamium composed by the curate at the gate they were received by the venerable housekeeper mrs oakley whose features were so brightened by the occasion that with the first glance she made a conquest of the heart of captain crow and this connection was improved afterwards into a legal conjunction meanwhile the houses of grevesbury hall and darnell hill were set open for the entertainment of all comers and both echoed with the sounds of festivity after the ceremony of giving and receiving visits had been performed by sir lancelot greaves and his lady mr clark was honoured with the hand of the agreeable miss dolly greaves and the captain was put in possession of his paternal estate the perfect and uninterrupted felicity of the knight and his endearing consort diffused itself through the whole adjacent country as far as their example and influence could extend they were admired esteemed and applauded by every person of taste sentiment and benevolence at the same time beloved revered and almost adored by the common people among whom they suffered not the merciless hand of indigence or misery to seize one single sacrifice ferret at first 
seemed to enjoy his easy circumstances but the novelty of this situation soon wore off and all his misanthropy returned he could not bear to see his fellow creatures happy around him and signified his disgust to sir lancelot declaring his intention of returning to the metropolis where he knew there would always be food sufficient for the ravenous appetite of his spleen before he departed the knight made him partake of his bounty though he could not make him taste of his happiness which soon received a considerable addition in the birth of a son destined to be the heir and representative of two worthy families whose mutual animosity the union of his parents had so happily extinguished end of chapter the last recording by jennifer painter end of the life and adventures of sir launcelot greaves by tobias smollett